So before I start, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sirag Munir and Professor Magid Mufti. Uh, Dr. Sirag is the one who started uh, the actual burn management in our department. Um, Dr. Lutfi Nassar, uh, he started the burns, Dr. Osman, but Dr. Siraj, Siraj is the one who started the recent evolution in burn management in our department uh, by his MD thesis on excision and grafting in burn. And also he has a great uh, contribution to restart the burn ITU in the Seigal Hospital. Uh, so I would like to thank him. And Dr. Siraj, Dr. Magid, Dr. Magdi uh, have the book Synopsis of Burn Surgery which may be the first book published from our uh, department. Uh, so today we, spe we speak about inhalation injury. Inhalation injury is present in up to one third of all burn injuries. However, it accounts for up to 90% of all burn related mortality. So inhalation injury is a major contribution for death in burns. And we should know exactly how to manage a patient with inhalation injury. Objectives of this lecture is uh, to know the bus physiology of inhalation injuries, diagnosis and treatment of inhalation injuries, and outcome of inhalation injuries. The extent of damage from an inhalation injury de depends on the environment and the host. It depends mainly on the source of injury, so it may be in a factory, contain toxic gases, temperature, concentration and solubility of toxic gases generated, and the response to that injury by the individual. Clinical significance of inhalation injury, it's associated with increased mortality in burn patient, airway closure secondary to oropharyngeal edema, increased resuscitation fluid requirements, Impaired pulmonary gas exchange, there is association with pneumonia and the risk of systemic inflammatory response syndrome and multi organ failure. So, both physiology of inhalation injury may be you can classify it into four things it affects upper airway injury, lower airway injury, lung parenchyma, and toxic gases. So upper airway injury means the oral pharynx, uh, the end result of it is edema. So it's induced by microvascular changes from direct thermal injury and the chemical irritation. So the heat of the thermal injury, denaturation of the protein, activation of complement, release of histamine, and superoxide ion. So the end result of that is upper airway edema. In addition, uh, the inhalation injury and thermal effect on the mucosa and blood vessels will lead to increase in the microvascular hydrostatic pressure and decrease in interstitial hydrostatic pressure and increase in interstitial oncotic pressure. And you take the patient in primary resuscitation and give him large amounts of crystalloid, so you will reduce the plasma oncotic pressure, which the net result of that is significant airway edema. Lower airway injury caused by the chemicals in smoke, accelerants or burn biological materials are caustic to the airway and induce initial response to trigger a pro-inflammatory response. So in lower airway injuries there will be tenfold increase in bronchial blood flow within minutes of inhalation injury, lead to increased permeability and destruction of bronchial epithelium, and there will be subsequent increase in pulmonary transvascular fluid, decrease in pressure of arterialized oxygen, fraction of inspired oxygen ratio less than or equal to 200, nearly within 24 hours after injury. There will be subsequent hyperemia of the trachea bronchial tree and lower airway, and that very, very prevalent technical finding is used to diagnose injury. We'll talk about that the hyperemia of the tracheobronchial tree. Even in the injury, secretions from goblet cells are copious and foaming. 
In ours today, these secretions will defy forming costs and airway obstruction. And this is a picture of the cost formed in the uh, bronchi of a chip, uh, which we use as a model for inhalation injury. What about the changes in the lung parenchyma following airway injury? So it's delayed. So we have upper airway injury, it's immediate thermal injury to upper airway lead to upper airway edema, lower airway injury, it starts from hours to one day to 24 hours of the injury, and lung parenchyma is delayed and depends on the severity of injury and the patient's response to the injury. It changes in lung parenchyma is complicated. So I I try to thinking in it as I, I am writing in a red exam. So for this is the effect of smoke inhalation, overall effect. It leads to coagulopathy and pulmonary vascular clots, which lead to impaired pulmonary gas exchange and pulmonary dysfunction. Airway epithelium, exfoliation, mucus secretion, and the bronchospasm, all of these are lower airway, increase airway blood flow, surge of venous inflammatory mediators into pulmonary circulation, releasing of nitric oxide and superoxides, lead to pulmonary vascular permeability increased, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary dysfunction. So, the net. The, high, the bus physiology of lung parenchyma, release of chemokine chemo interleukin 8, and influx of neutrophils into the airway and alveoli. Reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species are formed with oxynitride damaged DNA. DNA damage results in activation of polypolymerase, poly ADB ribose protects the damaged DNA but also activates the nuclear factor formation of inducible form of nitric oxide synthase and additional release of interleukin-8, attracting and activating additional neutrophils and forming more reactive nitrogen and oxygen species. I know it's complicated. You don't, uh, you don't need to know all this, just a release of chemokine, release of neutrophils, uh, activation of complement cascade, release of nitric oxide and oxygen species. I think this is enough. Uh, the end result of the oxidation, nitration, and nitrosation of lung tissue results in membrane damage, edema formation, and impaired oxygen diffusion. As the end result of that, loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, leading to perfusion of unventilated alveoli, and thus a fall in arterial oxygen saturation. Number four is systemic toxic changes. Smoke usually combines with toxins, increased mortality by increasing tissue hypoxia, metabolic acidosis, and decreasing cerebral oxygen consumption and metabolism. The most common toxic uh, absorption during inhalation injury is cyanide and the carbon monoxide. Uh, this table shows how to diagnose clinically carbo carboxyhemoglobin uh, toxicity according to the situation. So from non-symptoms to headache, which increase gradually, till it becomes severe headache when I have saturation of carboxyhemoglobin into 30 to 40% in blood, severe headache, weakness, dizziness, which may lead to collapse. And as saturation of carboxyhemoglobin uh, increase, there will be greater possibility of collapse, syncope, increased pulse and respiratory rate. And in case of 80-90% carboxyhemoglobin concentration, death in less than one hour. If it's 100% carboxyhemoglobinemia, it's this within a minute. So chemicals inhaled with the smoke lead to direct injury to the respiratory epithelium. And, the, and leading to inflammatory response, also like all, uh, like the lung parenchymal effect similar to injury produced by aspiration of acidic gastric content. So it will lead to direct injury to tissue. Airway become blocked by edema, bronchoconstriction, fibrin causes, necrotic debris, and degraded surfactant causes alveolar instability and collapse. So I tried to sum up all the bath physiology. Bath physiology is upper airway injury, leading to edema and airway block. 
lower airway injury leading to cuss formation and bronchospasm, parenchymal injury associated with release of interleukins, uh, nitrose uh, reactive oxygen submissions, and nitrose uh, species lead to, leading to decrease in ventilation, perfusion, pulmonary dysfunction, toxic cases, direct injury to respiratory epithelium, and indirect effect. In the result of all of that, it will be atelectasis and pulmonary dysfunction. So how I can diagnose uh, a with inhalation injury? So I am uh, a burn resident, and I get a call with this uh, major burn in Bab Sharia, one of the factories in Bab Sharia, and patients are come to me. So first thing, uh, in, the clinical in the clinical setting, diagnosis is relatively subjective judgment. Uh, because in initial presentation, patient may have normal gas, arterial blood gases, uh, normal chest radiograph. So you have to pick up the patient. But before you pick up the patient, you need to perform ATLS primary survey. So airway is the inhalation injury. You pick up the inhalation injury in airway, facial burns, hoarseness, evidence of smoke exposure, other classical signs of inhalation injury, I will tell it. Then you assess breathing, assess circulation, assess other ABCD, other uh, injuries, and then start to do your secondary survey by taking history of the patient. So you need to know the mechanism of burns, whether it's a flame, smoke, uh, the patient was in a closed chamber or in air, is, is it called the burn? So there is no inhalation injury with the scalds, or there is and the long time of exposure duration. So, for example, in Europe here we find patients drunken, and there is a, a, a burn, fire burn in in his home, and he can't respond because he's drunken. Maybe in Egypt you have uh, uh, patients who smokes or addicts to drugs, so. They maybe have um, no minds. Location, whether it's enclosed space or not, and disability. So the disabled patient has less liability to escape from the scene. After that, you will start your physical examination and looking for signs of inhalation injury. You look for facial burns, signed nasal or facial hair, carbonaceous sputum, soot, strider, or edema. All these signs will alert you to the possibility of inhalation injury. So you will go to try to do some diagnostic tools to confirm your diagnosis. We said that pulse oximetry and arterial blood gases may not be conclusive in the earlier uh, state of inhalation injury. Initial chest radiograph is not diagnostic, but you have to, to, to request them because it's a baseline for you. Fiber optic bronchoscopy allows direct visual, visualization of tissue damage to the upper airway and bronchi from heat and chemical irritants. So flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy, the gold standard for diagnosis of inhalation injury. You not do it by yourself. The anesthetists do it, some, some areas the ENT doctors, but you, you should be aware. So what's the evidence of inhalation injury by bronchoscopic examination? It's suit deposits and erythema in the uh, bronchi bronchioles, edema, mucosal blisters and erosions, hemorrhage, and bronchorea. So how can you assess uh, the severity of inhalation injury? There is a score to assess severity of inhalation injury according to finding of bronchoscopy. It's called abbreviated injury score. It's popularized by Endorf and Jamelli in 2007. Uh, it's assigned severity score from zero, no inhalation injury, to four, massive injury based on finding at the initial fiber optic bronchoscopic examination. Bronchoscopic criteria used to grade inhalation injury, grade zero, nothing, absence of carbonaceous deposits, erythema, edema, bronchorea, or obstruction. Grade one mild injury, it's minor or patchy area of erythema, carbonaceous deposits in proximal or distal bronchi. Grade two, which is moderate injury, you will find moderate degree of erythema, more carbonaceous deposits, bronchorea, with or without, compromise of the bronchi. Grade three, usually the same like before, but more severe and associated with bronchial obstruction. 
great for massive injury. There is evidence of mucosal sloughing, necrosis, and endoluminal obliteration. So is there any other tests um, to assess inhalation injury? Bronchoscopic assessment, highly useful. It's gold standard. Recently, there's some radionuclide studies represent an additional tool that has been used to provide evidence of pulmonary injury distal to the more proximal views parameter by flexible bronchoscopy. Chest CT could provide more diagnostic information. So from this system from carbon monoxide and or cyanide, any symptoms include headache, nausea, dizziness, and lowered mental status. Diagnosis required direct measurement of carboxyl hemoglobin. Take, um, take care because conventional pulse oximetry will not distinguish between carboxyl hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. hemoglobin. Carboxyl hemoglobin can be measured by arterial or venous carbon monoxide oximetry or pulse carbon monoxide oximetry. Signs and symptoms of various concentration of carb carboxyl hemoglobin levels, I mentioned it before, it depends mainly on the headache. So headache is the gold standard. And according to the degree of headache, it's a degree of carboxyl hemoglobinemia. Uh, at 40, 50% of carboxyl hemoglobinemia, patients going to collapse, syncope, and increase pulse and respiratory rate and uh, weak pulse occur at 70 to 80% of carboxyl hemoglobinemia, 90% is death in less than one hour, and more than 90% death within minutes. So management, the fundamental tenant of treatment of inhalation injury is supportive. Supportive care through the acute hospitalization and rehabilitation. Again, you have a patient, ATLS, and then assess the burn, uh, assess airway, breathing, circulation, then going to second other uh, injuries, instabilities, going to secondary survey, history, physical examination, assess the, um, the depth of burn and size of burn, total body surface area of the burn. So indication for EV tracheal intubation after inhalation injury is extensive burns over face and neck, over signs and symptoms of airway obstruction by edema, inability to protect the airway from aspiration, significant toxicity from carbon monoxide or cyanide, respiratory failure, and hemodynamic instability. So why not to all the patients I suspect inhalation injury? I take them immediately to theater and intubate them all because there is risks of unnecessary tracheal intubation of burned patients. It's embarrassed communication with the patient, so you may not get a history uh, about consent for surgery. Urgent attempts are more likely to fail or cause injury, especially if you have a patient at midnight, so you will have the most genial anesthetist to intubate the patient. Facial burns make it difficult to secure the intracal tube, and unintended extubations are common. Acute burn patients often require heavy sedation when intubated, which increases morbidity associated with unintended extubation. A translaryngeal intracal tube can exacerbate laryngeal injuries. So you know the indications of intubation, the risks of uh, unnecessary intubations. And after you support the airway of the patient and transfer to ITU, treatment of inhalation injury is mainly supportive. Supportive, supportive cares by bronchodilators and mucolytic agents, and respiratory support, ventilator management. You should know about something about ventilator management, tidal volume, and the modes of ventilation. Uh, you are not responsible for uh, managing the, the patient regarding the respiratory support, but if you are working in actual burn unit and in the ITU burn, there is a daily meeting between the burn doctor and the ITU doctor, anesthesia doctors. And the decision is usually um, MDT. It's multidisciplinary approach and 
decision is cooperative between you, so you should understand modes of ventilation. It's outside the scope of this lecture. Extubation criteria, when you take the decision to extubate the patient, when pressure of oxygen and FiO2 ratio more than 250 millimeter mercury, maximum inspiratory pressure more than 60, of vital capacity at least 15 to 20 milliliter per kg, spontaneous tidal volume 5 to 7, maximal voluntary ventilation two times the minute volume, resolution of the need for intubation, audio leak around the intracal tube. Uh, I am not doing this الخطوط الزرقاء والسوداء انا مش عارف اعمل كده انا ما اعرفش يا ريت تظهر عندي في البرزنتيشن واضح ان عند حضرتك الاسامه في حد يقعد في الكمبيوتر او كده بس دي مشكله عندي يعني رغم ان احنا رغم ان احنا قلنا ده هكر ده هكر على الزوم يا باشا اه في اوبشن على الرايت فوق يا جماعه اللي معاه الادمن او كنترول يقدر ان هو يريموف لاينز مكتوبه عندكم فوق. الادمن يقدر يشيلها. طيب اوكي. ممكن نميوت تاني او تسامع على الاذن؟ نعم. نميوت بس عشان الايكو. بقينا دقيقتين؟ بقينا دقيقة. طب يلا عشان هو الزوم هيقفل هنفتح واحد جديد للدسكشن. So tracheostomy, some burn centers elect to place a tracheostomy tube uh, in patients. Uh, this study compared to the, uh, the immediate tracheostomy with the tracheostomy after three weeks, and there is no difference um, in length of stay, instance of pneumonia, survival or duration of, uh, of intubation. Uh, typically, when uh, we Tracheostomy after three failed extubation attempts or after three weeks. Palate and anterior neck burns, tracheostomy usually a week after grafting of the neck burn. A non intubated protocol, IAN, which is intubation, treatment to treat humidify high flow oxygen to maintain oxygen saturation, sub, subres, supervise the patient performing coughing and deep breathing exercises. Turn the patient side to side every two hours, administer chest physiotherapy every two hours, or turn aerosolized uh, in acetylcysteine with abnocodilators, perform nasotracheal suctioning as needed, encourage early ambulation, educate the patient and family about the disease process and prognosis. Abnocodilators decrease the airflow resistance and improve the airway compliance. Beta, beta 2 blocker, abnocodilators. Uh, muscarinic receptor antagonist is a titrobium. We add an airway pressure and mucus secretions. In acetylcysteine is a very good mucolytic agent. Problem, it sometimes causes irritation of the, of the bronchitis.